Our first scripture lesson for today comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 22, verses 3 through 13. And as I read this, listen for God speaking to you. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to the high priest Hilkiah and have him count the entire sum of money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. Let it be given to the hands of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Let them give it to the workers who are at the house of the Lord repairing the house. That is, to the carpenters, to the builders, the masons, and let them use it to buy timber and quarreled stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them, for the money is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. The priest, the high priest, Hilkiah, said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. When Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. Then Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Shaphan the secretary informed the king, The high priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Shaphan then read it to the king. Then the king heard the words of the book of the law, for when he heard it, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded the high priest Hilkiah, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the secretary, and the king's servant, Asiah, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for the people in all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book, to do according all that is written concerning us. And our second scripture lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Again, listen for God speaking to you. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Family, this is the word of the Lord. This week, I had to go to an appointment, and it was all the way down in Palm Beach Gardens <laughs> to get out of the bubble of the Cuesta, and I had no idea where this place was, and so I did, uh, I did what anyone would do today, and that's uh, I brought my phone out, and I plugged in the address, and I let Google Maps tell me how to get to this place. Now, at first, everything seemed normal. Went down to Cuesta Drive, went over the bridge on A1A, and then things got a little weird. All of a sudden, I found myself in the middle of a random neighborhood, making all of these twists and turns, going through all these nooks and crannies, and I had no idea where I was or if Google Maps was taking me astray until Right at the end, I finally came out of this random back street and found myself at my destination. <coughs> now, when I got there, I was a little confused, and so I decided to go back to Google Maps and see what some of the different routes were. And I realized that there was a much simpler route I could have taken that just took all major roads and, and, and avoided a lot of these twists and turns. But I realized that Google Maps brought me through this random neighborhood, through all of these nooks and crannies, in an effort to save me two minutes on my trip. 
And that's when I started to see that sometimes technology is not the best way to show us how to get from one place to the other because what Google was trying to do was to get me there in the shortest period of time, and maybe it did, but it definitely didn't show me the best way how to get there. This week, we are continuing our series on the DNA of the church. This is us, the DNA of our church. And we are going to make a distinct shift in our series. So over the last couple weeks, we have explored who we feel God is calling us to be through the use of our mission statement. And last week, we explored where we feel God is calling us to go, the journey that we are called to travel through the use of our vision statement that you see on the front of your bulletin. We are people who are growing in faith and serving with love in everything that we do. But now we are making this shift and we are going to begin to explore how we feel we are going to get to where God is leading us. Because we all know that there are usually many different ways to get to a particular destination, or there are many different ways to travel on a journey. Like Google Maps showed me, there was, there's always a, a, a path that is the shortest, the quickest, the most efficient. Sometimes you can plug into the computer that you want to take a route that avoids tolls, or that avoids, that avoids uh, uh, lights. Stoplights. This would be a path of the least resistance. And sometimes those are good ways to travel a journey, but it's not always the best way to travel the journey. In the same way, we as a church, we're on this journey together with Christ as he leads us to be his disciples in this world and to help us grow in our faith and to help us serve with love. But how do we get there? How do we travel this journey? Do we take the quickest, easiest path? Do we take the path that offers us the least resistance? Or do we take what we feel is the best way to get there? And that's what we're going to explore. We're going to finish this series out so in fact, the bulk of our series is exploring how do we get to where we feel God is leading us. And we're doing that through the use of our four core values that we have also uh, approved and we've started to use in our leadership. And you can actually find those on the back of your bulletin. And I can commit to you and promise you that every time our leaders get together and every time they make decisions, they have these four values in mind. And today we're going to look at that top one, and actually it's also listed right above the, the sermon title, uh, this value that we are devoted to deepening our connection with God. Let's say that all together. We are devoted to deepening our connection with God. And what we mean by that is that everything that we do here, from gathering for weekly worship like this, or, or uh, meeting at the ladies' luncheon, or gathering for Bible study, meeting for small groups, Sunday school, <coughs> mission trips, everything that we do here is aimed at deepening our connection with God. And you can use another word if you want, maybe relationship with God, uh, a sense of the, the, re the reality of our faith, however you want to say it, we use the word connection. And we believe that everything that we do here is aimed at deepening our connection with God. Because without that connection, without that relationship, without that real, tangible connection with God, everything that we do here is just an empty ritual. Now in the passage that we read from 2 Kings, I know it's easy to get lost in all of the long names and the roundabout way that they told the story. But in reality, this is a huge moment in the history of Israel. Because Israel at this point had lost its way. And they were doing the right things. 
but they had completely lost the idea of, of why they were doing it. Everything they were doing in faith had lost its meaning because somewhere in the 400 years from Solomon all the way to King Josiah, things have been lost. And yes, they were going to the temple. Yes, they were doing the practices. Yes, they were saying the prayers and making the sacrifices, but they had lost their meaning and their purpose. And so they were just going through these motions. And all the while, around them, countries and nations and empires are starting to gather around them. And Israel found itself so confused. They're like, we're doing the right things. Why, why is God all of a sudden forsaking us? And it's this moment that King Josiah directs his people to go clean out the temple. And it's in this mundane chore. I hope you saw that it was kind of a mundane chore that King Josiah had sent his servants on. But it's where they found the book of the law. And they brought it to Josiah and they read Josiah the book of the law, which for us are the first five books of the Old Testament. And in the book of the law are these stories of God committing to have a relationship with us and committing to be with us no matter what. It's in the book of the law that we learn about Adam and Eve and how God continued to care for Adam and Eve even after they rebelled against him. It's in the book of the law that we hear about these amazing people like, uh, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and the way that God stayed with them as they started this nation of Israel. And it's in the book of the law that we hear about God's relationship with Israel and Moses as he takes them from Egypt and rescues them. He gives them a home. And I can just imagine Josiah reading this. And as he does, he starts to understand just how empty his faith had become because he'd lost that sense of connection with God. For that reason, he tore his clothes, which is just another way of saying he was grieving. And then he began to enact reforms in Israel to help the rest of God's people reestablish that connection with God. That's the story of what happened, but I, I think what really happened on that day is that Josiah learned the difference between transactional faith and transformational faith. You see, transactional faith, those who practice transactional faith, you might see them at church, you might see them in Bible study, you might even see them on a mission trip, because on the, on the front, everything looks the same, but it's about what motivates people. And transactional faith is one that seeks to do the right things in order to receive the right stuff. So those who practice transactional faith try to be the best Christians they can be, but only so that they can be assured of salvation after they die. Or they go and they try to be the best Christians they can be, only so that they can feel good about themselves at the expense of others who might not be doing as well as they think they should be. And again, on the surface, it might look very similar, but what's going on on the inside is this emptiness. <coughs> and there's two major problems of transactional faith. The first is that it ironically pushes God out of the picture because it boils our faith down to a set of codes and morals. Earlier this week, I listened to this report on atheism. Atheism is the belief that there is no God. And they sought to interview what they were trying to characterize as positive atheists. And so I know often if we think of atheists, we think of people who are really angry at us Christians, and they're always picking a bone with us and wanting to fight us. But not all atheists are like that. So they went and they were interviewing these people who are atheists and asking them, why? And, and what is life like to them? What is faith like to them? And all of them seem to be very happy, positive people. And they have committed to live a life where they do their best to take care of themselves 
so that they can then go out and take care of others and make this world a better place and to make this world a place where everyone cares for one another just a little bit more. That was the code of conduct that these atheists all ascribed to. Does that sound familiar? I was listening to this and I was like, I preach this every single week. Because a huge part of the response that we have to our faith is that yes, we do go out and we take care of ourselves. And we do go out and take care of the earth. And we are called to go out and take care of one another. But those actions come from something deeper. But if we only boil it down to the actions, if we only think of faith as the act of going out and taking care of one another, we actually take God out of the equation. And the atheists have done a really good job of taking the best of the Christian life and stripping God out of the equation. That's the first real weakness of transactional faith. Is when we really think about it, it really pushes God out of the equation. The second issue with transactional faith is that a code of conduct is not going to be there for you when we experience extreme hardships in life. A code of conduct isn't going to be there and wrap us up in comfort when we lose a loved one too soon. <clears throat> A code of conduct isn't going to give us a sense of comfort or peace when we're struggling with very hard decisions in life. A code of conduct isn't going to share in our moments of extreme joy. A code of conduct is just that, a bunch of words on a page. <coughs> That's why God doesn't call us to seek transactional faith, but rather God calls us to seek transformational faith. And transformational faith is the belief that being in the presence of God and opening ourselves up to God's presence in our lives and God's presence in this world will transform us, surely by being closer to God and growing closer to God. Because I think all of us have experienced this, this reality that being in the presence of something or someone greater can often rub off on us and have an impact on us. Next week, the Los Angeles Rams are going to the Super Bowl for the first time in a very long time. And they're being led by Sean McVay, who is the youngest coach in the history of the NFL, and he's now the youngest coach to lead a team to the Super Bowl. Now, there's something about the story of a 33-year-old man who's been tasked to lead a group of diverse individuals to understand their potential and to reach places they've never stopped before that interests me personally. That's a joke. <laughs> I'm really interested in Sean McVeigh's story and how he got to where he was at the very young age of 33. Like yours truly. <laughs> and I read his story and he attributes a lot of his success to those first few years out of college when he was an assistant to the assistant coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It wasn't a glorious job. He wasn't in front of the TV. He wasn't making all these decisions. He was kind of this grunt worker helping the assistants help the head coaches. And in that, though, he had this opportunity to spend a lot of time with a lot of great people. And he attributes most of his success to John Gruden, who is a legendary coach. He's won a Super Bowl before. And he's very well respected in the coaching community. And so what he said he did in those first few years is he did nothing to, <coughs> to help out. All he did was he sat there and he listened and he soaked everything in that John Green would let him soak in. 
and he watched as he saw it, John Gruden lead the team and the employees. He watched as John Gruden prepared for each week. And in that, in experiencing that and just being around that, it started to rub off on him. And he was transformed in the way that he thought about coaching and, and what it takes to be a successful coach and what it takes to, to lead a team to the Super Bowl. It all started with just being in the presence of someone who had been there before, someone who's been successful. And now look at them. Ten years later, leading this team of players, many of whom are older than he is, to the Super Bowl. In the same way, we believe that being in the presence of the Lord will continue to transform us. Josiah discovered this in 2 Kings and in Hebrews. We see the benefit that we have as people who have come to know Jesus Christ. Because it's in Jesus Christ that we have God's full revelation. And it's in Jesus Christ that we can be assured that we have this connection to God that is real and powerful. And if we spend our lives committing to making that connection real and deepening that connection, we will be transformed <coughs> as we continue to grow closer to God and then share God with others. And that's what we commit to do here at church. Everything that we do here, we do for a reason. The prayers the Apostle Creed, the songs that we sing here, the ladies' luncheon that's happening next week, the Bible study that we do every week, the food for families that we do every month, our great banquet weekends. These are all opportunities for us to grow closer to God, and every time we do this, we become more like the church that God has called us to be. A group of us young parents went out last night, and we laughed together. We had so much fun talking about just raising our kids, being a part of this church. And we started to commit to meeting more often together so that when we face hardships in life, we'll have other parents who will help us along the way, and we can help raise our kids in the faith just as all of us have vowed to do when we baptize those babies. That's church. There's a group of men who meet at Corner Cafe every week. That's church. This is church. Bible study is church. The ladies' luncheon is church. And we do this because we believe that as we get together and practice our faith together, we grow closer to God together and we deepen our connection to God together. So whether it is the worship service or the family potluck or everything in between, we aim to give all of us here every opportunity we can to help us grow closer to God together and to deepen that connection. So I want to invite you, if this is the only time that you spend time with this family, try something more. Stay back behind for a food for families and get to know some of the people who are helping pack this food so that we can go feed families. Come to the ladies' luncheon if you're a lady and if you're a man, come help serve. Help me serve these wonderful ladies' lunch. Take three days out of your life and get away from everything and do a great banquet weekend here. You take three days to focus on your relationship with God. Find a group here and get plugged in. And I guarantee you, you won't only receive the benefit of wonderful new friends, but you will find yourself growing closer to God. And we will all be transformed because of it. Next week, we are going to talk about mission work. What's mission work? How do we approach mission work here? But before we get there, I'd like all of us this week to reflect on what type of faith are we practicing? 
Are we settling for transactional faith? Or are we deepening our connection to God in whatever we do? My prayer is that we can all do this together as a family, deepen our connection with Christ, and do that together until the day that He comes again. To God be all glory and honor and praise. Amen.